This UCSD TV program is a presentation of University of California Television for educational and non commercial use only. Good evening and welcome to the 16th Annual Writers' Symposium by the Sea from the campus of Point Loma Nazarene University. My name is Carl Martin. I teach in the Department of Literature at Point Loma. Uh, and tonight we have a, a very special opportunity to welcome uh, one of the founding members of the Birds, a founding member of the Flying Burrito Brothers and the Desert Rose Band, an artist whose vibrant uh, performing and recording career has now spanned more than 40 years. He obviously started when he was very young. <laughs> His latest release with Herb Peterson is called At Edwards Barn. Uh, they'll be playing uh, a little later on tonight. Will you please join me in welcoming to the Writers' Symposium member of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, Mr. Chris Hillman. Chris, you were, you were playing music for quite some time before you actually started writing songs. Uh, can you talk about how and when you started writing songs? I started writing around 1966. I had been in the Birds, oh, a year and a half. We started the Birds in late 1964. I had been, always was a, a player more than a singer or a songwriter, and I just started around 1966. Uh, I've told the story many times. I'll, I'll be as quick as possible. I went in and did a session for Hugh Masekela, South African trumpet player. He had a hit back in the late 60s, uh, Grazing in the Grass. And I played bass on a session for him. It was a demo session. Uh, wonderful musicians from Africa and totally out of my comfort zone as a musician. It was different kind of music. But coming home from that session that day, Carl, I started, I, I sat down and wrote a song, nothing to do with the music I had just been playing all day. It was a country song. It was my first song, Time Between. And, and then I just, it started flowing. It was like the floodgates opened. Yeah. And I don't know why, how that happened. It just opened up and uh, I started writing songs, you know. And did the other members of the Birds kind of welcome your contribution to the songwriting? I think they were a little end? shocked and amazed, and not, and not from a competitive place. They were just, uh, I remember uh, Roger McGuinn, <laughs> we had a rehearsal, and Roger had heard this song I'd written, Have You Seen Her Face? And he, and he says to David Crosby as he walks, and he says, you better listen to what Chris just wrote. And because I was the shy one in the group, I, I was in the back line. If you ever YouTube the Birds, from the old days, I'm in the back playing the bass. I could barely look people in the eye. I was such a shy kid. And so it was, they were very encouraging and, uh, like I say, more, more amazed that, <laughs> where did this come from? Yeah. Oh, boy, you know, so. Much of the songwriting you've done as well has been in collaboration with other songwriters. Mm -hmm. uh, how has that worked for you? I mean, it seems like that's something you enjoy. What is it about collaboration that you enjoy as a songwriter? It's a give and take uh, effort. It's uh, editing yourself, almost self editing. Uh, and it really depends on the person you're working with. You have to have a very close uh, relationship uh, with that person and bond in a certain way that you can be able to let out all those inner emotions to put down on paper. And, and writing a song, as I was saying earlier today, uh, basically doing a short story in three and a half minutes, and you're opening with an opening line, your plot, your closing, and then the repetitive chorus sort of summarizes the whole story. And to work with another person, you really have to be very close with, I think. Yeah, I mean, there are people that do this as for a living that are staff songwriters, work with three or four people they don't know, but I, I prefer this way, yeah. And can you talk a little bit more about that notion of, of telling a short story? Because the song form, you're also working within rhyme scheme and those, those kinds of things. So it seems like you're very aware of, of a, a song form that you've inherited from a tradition, and you're writing in that tradition. 
I am trying to stay within the parameters, as every songwriter does. But I also subscribe to the no rules theory. But the no rules theory is limited because you don't, you're not trying to fool the, the listening public. You want something that's melodic, accessible, but it, and it's not something contrived where you're, you've thought out that process. Here I, I'm going to write the second verse, but I'll make it easier for them. To, it's not that at all. So you're really writing from your heart and you're following your heart, but within, uh, as I was saying at the workshop today, less is more. Keep it as simple and to the point, you know, and, and that's what I've tried to do. I don't always get there, but yeah. In your work, all the way back to the birds through the, the Flying Burrito Brothers, Desert Rose Band, the work you've done with Herb Peterson, you've also recorded a lot of songs written by other musicians. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you could compare the process of adapting another songwriter's song for your own recording purposes or performing purposes to, to writing your own song. Are those very different experiences for you? How, how do you go about adapting another songwriter's work to make it your own? Well, initially, you'll hear this song that you really like. And in my case, because I'm so impatient, I never sometimes would never learn this song, actually, every, perf every chord in the right sequence. And it ended up that I would take another song that I really liked and I just, I would play it and I'd, I'd work on it a, a while before if I got to that point of recording it, which usually was the case. And, and somehow it would come out and I would have it sort of stylized and I would, I would put my brand on it, so to speak, rather than emulating that artist. Because that'd be sort of ludicrous for me to try and, let's say, take a Merle Haggard song and then try to sing it exactly like Merle Haggard or play it exactly. You don't want to take that song and the beauty of the lyric and adapt it into your, your, your signature. Mm -hmm. You know, it's really what you want to do. Yeah. What, what advice would you give to young songwriters then about listening to, to older music, listening to other people's work. Is that a good thing for a young songwriter to do? That's an excellent thing. I strongly recommend uh, anybody who is a songwriter or embarking on a, on a career in music or just playing music, listen to the old music, listen to the masters. And I, I say in all genres, jazz, country, and rock, and, and they, they, none of them had a blueprint. You listen to the early Elvis Presley on Sun Records, and he's coming out of left field, and he's so good. And, and he, here he was absorbing a, a lot of gospel music, a lot of early blues and R&B in his music. And uh, there, there's that, Elvis, there's all these, uh, the wonder years of rock and roll, which I think from 55 to around 1960, and study that music and study the old country music and how they formed a lyric and how Hank Williams would take the simplest chord changes and add these beautiful lyrics and, and uh, Lefty Frizzell and of course Merle Haggard, everybody from that area, the old jazz, the old bebop. Uh, and as I, we had spoken earlier, and I said my lyrical uh, lyricist hero is Johnny Mercer. Johnny Mercer's written so many beautiful songs, pop standards, really. And I ended up now at my age listening to the music my parents listened to. And I love it. I just love it. Because uh, I, you think back, Carl, and, and uh, that music was being written and performed in the late 30s and 40s. And the, <clears throat> the medium was radio and film. And there wasn't all of this stuff and life was simpler, and we're not going to turn the clock back, and I'm not advocating we turn the clock back and bring it back to that time. But there was something about the correlation of that simplicity that, that where people were writing and reading at a far, you know, days when people would read three or four newspapers in a day, right? Or most major cities had three newspapers, or maybe four. But, and there's uh, these beautiful uh, writers, Cole Porter, uh, uh, Johnny Mercer, uh, Hoagie Carmichael, and people like that. And uh, it was coming into my head as a child. My parents listened to music all the time, but I could never have put it into, into uh, what I did. I, I, I went, was gravitating to another kind of music. You know? Well, and this, this, it seems to me that the, this process of crossing genres and not settling on one genre is something that you've, that you've loved to do and has been an influence on you for a long time. And, one of the things that you, among some other folks, are credited with the development of, of country rock, 
And I think especially for younger members of our audience, can you define that term? How does that <laughs> differ from country music? How does it differ from rock music? Not too, <laughs> well, <clears throat> I guess, you know, and, and with all due respect, back in, in 1969 when we were doing the Flying Burrito Brothers, I think a, a, a journalist at some point sort of tagged that, as he did with the birds when we did folk rock. Well, what was it? It was the birds taking a Bob Dylan song and, and recording it, and then doing uh, Pete Seeger's rendition, who is Pete Seeger, the, the, the fabulous folk singer who's been an icon in our culture, uh, uh, his rendition of Turn, 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 taking biblical verse and putting music to it. So the birds doing that kind of music became folk rock. And then uh, Graham Parsons and I, and prior to that, the birds to some degree, taking country music and putting, once again, that signature thing to it. And so what would define that? I personally think it's a little bit more emphasis on the rhythm, on the backbeat, uh, taking songs out of a genre, as we did in the burritos, where we did a couple of R&B songs. I mean, straight out, Stax, Volt, Memphis, R&B songs, and did them uh, in, co in a country uh, arrangement. But in all fairness, Ray Charles did that too, way before us. You know, modern sounds and country music, you know, pretty amazing. It was Ray Charles, but he was taking songs from a different genre, but still had the Ray Charles stamp. How did that, uh, how was that received among country fans, among uh, rock we, fans? We Sweetheart, of the, Sweetheart of the Rodeo, <laughs> Fly Burrito Brothers, how was this received uh, by the fan base? Sweetheart here? of the Rodeo was the worst selling record we made, but the most critically acclaimed. And, and, and as the years went by, it is still the most critically acclaimed record. And the burritos, too, have become a cult favorite now. We couldn't get arrested back then. We couldn't get on country radio. We couldn't get on rock radio. And, and uh, we were a little loose, but it was an interesting sound. It was a real just uh, going at it with full abandon, reckless abandon. We were playing that music. You know. Uh, there's also a strong influence, especially in the Burrito Brothers, of gospel music. Of yeah. uh, There's imagery from gospel right. songs. There's imagery from, yeah. as, as you've said, songs of the church. Right. Uh, and I, I've heard you speak specifically about Sin City, and I, I'd, I'd love to hear you tell that story to our audience tonight, that the way that you were borrowing melody from church songs, as you say, and some mm -hmm. imagery from that. Can you kind of talk us through that? Well, Sin City was a special song that uh, Graham Parsons and I wrote. And uh, 1969, we were putting the Flying Burrito Brothers together, and we were sharing a house, we were roommates. And we were bond, we were so close, working as brothers at the time, just as tight, and this is the thing about collaboration, Carl. This is when it was working. And Sin City was interesting. Graham had this great love of country music as I did, so we immediately hit it off. And Sin City, <clears throat> was sort of a tongue-in-cheek look at the culture at the time, and, uh, and then we were sort of going on about Hollywood. This old town is filled with sin. It'll swallow you in if you've got some money to burn. Take it home right away. You've got three years to pay, and Satan is waiting his turn. So what did we do? And this is, wasn't uh, uh, thought out ahead of time. It was just, it was inside of us, and we both drew from the gospel the old Baptist hymns, okay, and using that terminology, but in a contemporary setting. And, and we go on through the, the chorus of this old earthquake's gonna leave me in the poorhouse. And as I was talking today about uh, back in the, in the uh, late 60s, everybody my age group were going, oh, the big earthquake's gonna come. We're all gonna. Uh, fall into the sea. Uh, idle chatter is going on. Maybe happens sometime. I don't know. But uh, I don't want to be on the freeway when that happens, by the way. Um, so we use that, and then we, each verse sort of touches on something in Sin City. Now, now here's an uh, example of a song that was inside of us, and it came out within 30 minutes. We wrote that song. And I, I woke up, I started, this old town's filled with sin of swallowing, and and I got through most of that verse and a little bit of the chorus. I got Graham up, and we finished that song in 20, 25 minutes afterwards. And uh, the, uh, each verse connecting with something. Uh, <clears throat> the scientists say it'll all wash away if you don't believe anymore. 
So there's that gospel connection. The last verse is about Robert Kennedy. A friend came around, tried to clean up this town. And it was really interesting. And, and uh, my, one of my favorite tunes we ever do, and we still sing it. We still do that song. And uh, I must have performed that uh, for the last 40 years, you know, and, and never get tired of it, you know. Are there other songs like that for you that, that have particularly kind of stood the test of time that as you have, um, have matured as a musician, th these are songs either because of the melody that is so attractive or because of a lyric that has remained interesting and important to you that, that you well, particularly I, I, enjoy singing? I truly love Turn, 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 and I didn't write it. Solomon, King Solomon wrote it. I'm not sure if he's getting, his heirs are getting any money for that. <laughs> I doubt if they'll tra trace that one. Uh, but. I love that song, and, I, and uh, Roger McGuinn, uh, the lead singer in The Birds, he sang it at my wedding 32 years ago. It's a charmed song. I've, I've uh, sang it at funerals. I believe I sang it at a wedding once. I, I think mostly a lot of times at funerals. And it's such an interesting verse out of Ecclesiastes 3. It's so black and white, and he's saying to everything there is a season, turn, 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 which it really was added by Pete Seeger, that part, and, which is a wonderful summary of the whole thing, but it was all black and white. It was just good, there's evil, there's right and wrong, there's rich and poor, there's weak, there's strong, and it was all just as it lies, and as you get older, you go, well, you know, there really isn't much gray area in a lot of these things in life, you know? I mean, there's places where we stretch it a little, but. It has such wisdom, and I, that song never fails to get me. Yeah. There's a couple more, but I, I'd have to think for a minute, yeah. and that's a tough one. <laughs> as, an, as an instrumentalist, you came into the birds as a bass player, mm -hmm. uh, but since that time, mandolin has really become the instrument that you play most or love most. I started playing <clears throat> the mandolin in high school, and I just, I, I, I was exposed to uh, uh, early string band music, the New Lost City Ramblers, and then later Bluegrass. I, I just loved the mandolin. It touched a nerve with me. And I sought out anybody I could to teach me. I had to go all the way up to Berkeley, California on a train at age 16 and take lessons from a fellow named Scott Hambly, who's still up there now, who's a musicologist. Uh, he taught me. Most of started me out. I started my career right down the street, right off of Rosecrans on Midway Drive at a place called the Blue Guitar. And it was started by Ed Douglas and Larry Murray and a fellow named Eurus Zeltons, Zeltons, who still has, I think, the name the Blue Guitar. Not there in that location. I started playing there in 63, mandolin. So mandolin was my main instrument in bluegrass music. When I got the call for the birds and they said, uh, can you, pl I'd heard them sing. I'd heard the three guys in, sing in the band, Crosby, McGuinn, and Gene Clark, and I thought they were incredible, and doing Beatles songs and things. And I get the call, can you play the bass? I said, yeah. I'd never picked a bass up, <laughs> ever. And I s went in there, the, that first rehearsal. I'm assuming they're all just incredibly proficient on their instruments. They had a fellow they'd hired uh, that was in the group, Mike Clark, who played drums. I said, well, this is going to be really a, a bluff on my part. And nobody knew what they were doing. Everybody had come out of folk music. And we all literally plugged our amplifiers in, what we had at the time, into the wall and started playing. We had no blueprint. We did not know what we were doing. And that's the beauty of the birds. And Roger <laughs> McGuinn was the most seasoned musician. He had been an accompanist to Bobby Darin to Chad Mitchell Trio, to the Limelighters. He had produced Judy Collins at a young age. He was 21 years old. I was not, about 19 or 18 years old. And we all played the music around his 12-string guitar, and he would finger pick, and, and the sound developed. And then we had a wonderful uh, guy uh, functioning as a manager who the greatest advice I ever got, and we all got. He said, you guys go for substance and depth in these songs. He said, make music that you'll be proud of in 40 years. And what great advice. I mean, we, as opposed to grabbing the quick hit that you might think will get on the radio real quick. You know. And that, that advice was specifically related to, to listening to Bob Dylan, to Mr. Tambourine Man, wasn't it? That listening to that, you guys 
the he, band wasn't wild about that song. He brought us that record, and he had he knew Bob's manager Albert Grossman at the time, and and uh, and we had permission to do it. And we he brings in an old uh, demo, and which was an acetate of Bob Dylan and Rambling Jack Elliott singing Mr. Tambourine Man, and we didn't like it. And all the verses are beautiful, just beautiful poetry, and. He said, listen to it again. And then we arranged it. I, I give a lot of credit to McGuinn, who arranged it into a more danceable groove, right. so to speak, in a, more of a 4-4 time that made it something easier to dance. Because Bob had written it as a, almost like a bluegrass tune. And uh, we only did one verse. We were limited on radio play. At the time, there was only AM radio. Right. FM was just a dream. It hadn't quite. Uh, developed as a, as a major uh, uh, music format, FM radio. So here we had limited to a two minute to two and a half minute single. So we could do one verse of Mr. Tambourine there and there's three or four that are beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. The, the, one of the interesting things about being a fan of, of music is that when I hear a song, I hear the whole package together. Um, so Mr. Tambourine Man becomes as much about that opening guitar lick as it does about the lyric, uh, Eight Miles High becomes just as much about your opening bass lick as it does the lyric. And can you talk about how a song comes together in the studio? You, you come in with a melody and, and lyrics, but there's so much more to that that goes into a recording. Uh, you play it, and you play it, and you try things, and it clicks, and you know. And I, I always, my, my analogy was, sort of silly, but I, I said, you know, bands, when they're starting out, it's almost like we each band member has a paintbrush and we're all painting the Mona Lisa smile. And if when we get it right as a, as a unit, as an entity, that's the magic. So in a song, you're sitting there and you're arranging it, you know, and there's, a, there's different circumstances. Sometimes a, a group will have one fellow that's a, more of an arranging type, but I think it's just uh, repetition and playing. And, you know. Yeah. Are there artists that, that especially maybe some of the college students in, the, in our audience who are interested in songwriting, artists that they probably are not listening to that you think they ought to listen to? Can you think of some, besides, of course, the Burrito Brothers and the Birds and the Desert yeah. Rose Band? Well, I, I, you know, I would, I, I would hate to, to uh, tell anybody what to listen to, but I mean, I love, I, and I, it's up to the individual. I mean, I, I certainly would point them to the well once again, and that would be uh, Hank Williams uh, in country music and whatever. I mean, Hank's, Hank's Williams songs, Tony Bennett had a hit uh, with one of his songs, and uh, help me, Carl. You're cheating hard. You're cheating hard. Yeah. There it was, the great country song, and Tony Bennett takes it, bam, terrific. And I think Mitch Miller did that, produced that. Um, Listen to as many songwriters as you can. I couldn't tell you current ones. Um, I think Brad Paisley in country music is very interesting, the way he comes up with a lyric, because he's very funny. He has this very funny sense of humor. He did this terrific song called Celebrity, and in it was everything from I, I got out of rehab, I crashed my Ferrari, and it was like watching reality TV on this song. Here's three minutes of his great. Um, but uh, I, I, me, personally, I would say uh, uh, listen to the older stuff, but follow your heart and write from a comfort zone, meaning write what you know. Write what you know. And um, uh, otherwise, approach it, uh, create, the, create the story, create a, an, an interesting narrative. I always like that area of songwriting. But you, you talked earlier today, too, about the difference between narrative songwriting and kind of an emotional songwriting, that the songwriting that strives to tell a story, and then there's songwriting that is almost a cathartic experience mm. for the songwriter. Um, and those, the balance of those two um, seems to be very important as well. Well, I mean, uh, sometimes you'll start out, and like I say, I mean, songwriting, you, you could hear somebody uh, utter a, a four-word phrase, and it'll catch you, some stranger on the street even, or a friend, write it down. 
that can start the song process. Where it goes from there, sometimes it's beyond your control. You're really sort of guided through that. It could end up being something down here inside of you, and it becomes cathartic, a catharsis, where you, you, you get out something uh, that's sitting inside of you. And, and, and the other times, it could turn into some sort of narrative and, and a sort of a storyline, you know. And I, I, I had a song, um, I didn't do it today, but called Hard Times. There's a lot of songs called Hard, hard Times. With, but, uh, uh, or no, let me take that back. Uh, 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 hard Times is good, but there's one called Desert Rose, which the Desert Rose Band was named after. And I wrote that back in the early 80s, and my daughter was about uh, three. And at the time, we were going through some ec economic problems in this country, mostly in the Northeast. And a lot of people uh, were leaving their families and going down to Houston to find work. And this was going on I think, early 80s. And I wrote this song, uh, I Love My Sweet Desert Rose, because my daughter's middle name was Rose. And so I, here's the song idea. When I'm reading this thing, and I go, wow, so I write this song, and the, the chorus was, there ain't no money in our hometown. And the wells of all, or and the mills have all shut down. They say there's work, but it's always the next town. So here's this guy. He says, "There's no work here. We've got to go on to the next." But he's left his home, he's left his daughter and his kids behind, and it's eating him up. So um, there was a sort of story, but an emotional bent yeah, to the brings that the narrative. Two. To the narrative was the emotional lyric of it all. It brings those two sides together. Yeah. So that happens, but. That's not something I sat down and say, today I'm going to write a song and it's going to go here and here it just comes out, you know. And sometimes it comes out quick and sometimes it takes a long time and you, you agonize over it, you know. Thank you so much. It You're has welcome. been wonderful to no, sit down and talk with you. We are, I know the half hour is over. We want to make sure that uh, we save some time to hear some music. Mm -hmm. uh, from this wonderful uh, musician and songwriter who will be joined shortly by Herb Peterson, to uh, perform for us. Will you uh, join me in thanking Chris Hillman? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, just talking up here a minute ago about a song called Desert Rose, about the fellow that had to leave his hometown, go down the, from the from the northeast area and go down to Houston to look for work, and here it is. I see tonight that she's alone. I keep thinking back to home. I've got that feeling, I know that it shows.
Folks, I, I think what we'll do, our good friend Emmy Lou Harris, we love doing this song, and, and the, about th two weeks ago, Charlie Leuven passed away. Certainly an influence on us, Charlie and his brother Ira, the Leuven brothers. You singers and you songwriters out there, listen to the Leuven brothers. You want to hear some songs and singing that just knock you over. And uh, Emmy said... Uh, She's that their music was washed in the blood, and boy, was it ever when they did those gospel songs. We're going to do a song that Herb Peterson sang with Emmy Lou back in 1974, launched her career in country music. We'll do that in A or G tonight, sir. Which, where do you want to do uh, Win Your Love. Yeah, I know. But what, what key would you like? It's your, ni your night. Hey, Just, okay, James, yeah, he likes great. to sing high. <laughs> he likes to put me through the mill. But this really launched her career, and, and uh, he was on this record from the get-go. Sounded great. It was just like they got all these weird bracelets on the wire. You do. Here we go. Here we go. Can I ever say 
both California natives, and he grew up in the northern part of the state, and I, of course, grew up um, actually in the North County. And, uh, yep, yeah, when, it, when you could drive through there with no freeway, you go all over the place, shoot things, and have a good time. Let it go. No. Come on. No, Come on. I can't do that. So, we're going to do a song about Bakersfield, and um, where a lot of our good music came from. And this is a song that Buck Owens and Dwight Yoakam did a few years ago. It's such a great tune. It's a, it's a funny song, and it's a, it's a serious song. And You don't know me, and you don't like me. It's uh, in the verse. It's uh, Streets of Bakersfield. goes just like this. Here's a country song. It can't get any more country than this that Buck Owens wrote and recorded. It had a huge hit for Buck, who was a good pal of ours. For Tom Brumley, who was a steel player in the Buck Owens and the Buckaroos, worked in the Desert Rose Band. What a great guy. We both 
they're both are gone now and they're watching us now and we better get it right. Better get it right. Yeah. Together again. My tears have stopped falling.
Thank you. It doesn't matter which you 
Here's a song called Heaven's Lullaby. I'm going to dedicate to my beautiful wife, who's up for sainthood. She's <laughs> lived with me 32 years. Married, mind you, to me 32 years. We have two great children. Couldn't be a more blessed man in this world. Heaven's Lullaby, one, two, one, two, three, four. 